Guy's asking, how do I deal with rage while I'm plugging, reading, and living with my wife? And it's extremely important because the anger phase is something that hits... I mean, if you're listening to this... You've come here because the anger phase led you to, like, a random internet search. You know, why won't my wife have sex with me? Or, you know, why is everything so hard? Or, heaven forbid, you entered one of those red meat channels that just like to weaponize your anger against you to monetize some stuff. Regardless of how you got here, this is going to be an example on why mental models are so important. I'm sure you've heard a lot of characters like Scott Adams talk about how there's one screen, people are watching two different movies or uh, The Secret and all that crap like it's basically what this is is you create a narrative inside of your head and that narrative inside of your head is how you anchor your decisions now considering how subjective that is really the only guidance you have you can't just say follow the truth because again you can interpret truth as like a good for some people or bad for some people so what you have to do is just pick the models that tend to give you the best outcomes if you want to get really philosophical about it and God knows why you would. You would talk about like Nietzsche's slave and master moralities, but I mean that's too that's too nerdy for me. We're talking about actually having a good relationship and sleeping with people, and you don't get there by reading Nietzsche. So I'm just gonna get started. Uh, the poster's guy's name is What Is Real Anymore? Again, he's got. I think he took the Matrix reference a little too literally, but whatever. He is reading through the sidebar and got into red pilled stuff. My God, this stuff made me rage so hard, especially Confessions of a Reformed Incel and Michael's Story, which if you don't know what those two things are, there's two videos on my channel under the sidebar series that talk about Confessions of a Reformed Incel and Michael's Story. The first one being the story of a guy who went from 12 years of celibacy and all of the mental and physical anguish that goes with that and the process of him turning himself into an attractive man who gets laid and finds himself on the other side, like the end of Shawshank Redemption. While Michael's story is the story about a nice, uh, traditionally conservative wannabe guy who's finding out that girls really are just hypergamous and they have their fun in their 20s. And then he thinks there's some revenge fantasy at the end of it. And he finds out, it turns out that yeah, women are going to have their cake and eat it too. They're going to enjoy their 20s and they're going to settle down in their 30s and there's nothing you can do about it. So you might as well learn to play the game instead of getting mad and hoping that uh, they get their comeuppance. Back to the thing though. So he's here expecting a blowjob from his wife, but right now he's so angry at his blind self for marrying her. Yes, I love her. But if I had read Married Man's Sex Life Primer in college, I'd have never married her, much less dated her. And that ticks me off. What brings me back to reality is reality. She's the mother of my children. She takes care of them in the house. She meets my physical and sexual needs. And in general, she adds value to my life. That's also what I'm angry about too. My feeling of love is gone and replaced with cold objectivity. Most of the negative thoughts don't come to me until I'm neck deep in my reading. I need to be aware of what the sidebar will do for my frame and make sure I have the time to digest and reflect before I go back to relationship mode with the wife. For example, I left in the morning and I do insanity or T25 in the afternoon. I got to reading the sidebar stuff late this evening before bed and it just wrecked my mood. Still got a blowjob but it took a while for me to get into it. I plan on reading in the morning around lunch and give myself time to process the material and the rage. Do you guys have a similar experience or thoughts on tactically getting through this material? Did you adjust your reading behaviors to manage the rage? And he added afterwards here, like I filled in some more detail about the kind of advice I'm after specifically and what I'm specifically angry at. And after fleshing this out, I realize it go, it should be like an own your shit kind of field report thing, but I'm leaving it here. Hopefully it helps others. Couple takes away from this. First thing, realize the guy's sexually successful. Like you being angry isn't naturally a detriment, isn't naturally a detriment. Treating your girl less than you think she's worth or uh, unkind as, you know, I'm sure he does or in that cold objectivity doesn't make a difference on whether you are attractive or not unattractive, which is kind of a freeing thing. It turns out, yeah, the same Chad in high school who had uh, 
horrible, horrible treatment of women, got all the, all the sex in the world. It turns out how you feel about somebody doesn't affect how well you're treated back. So it's, it's a freeing thing in that sense that your own mental models are just there for you. Your actions are what affect everything around you. Secondly, if he's talking about, I guarantee you at some point he's gotten through that saving the best thing. You know, girl was a slutty girl in college and now she maybe doesn't do the same kind of stuff. And I get that. He's getting what he wants now, but he's maybe not getting what she gave him back then. And for a lot of guys, it's weird. For some reason, let's say, let's just use uh, the butt stuff as an example. Maybe you have no interest in that whatsoever. Now, let's say you find out your wife, when she was in college, used to do it all the time, and now she doesn't want it. All of a sudden, a guy is angry that he's not getting it. That thing that five minutes ago he didn't want. So that's not so much an issue of getting what you want out of life. That's an issue of feeling, like, slighted. But it's only... Like, it's not a way to have frame. Like, are you getting what you want needs to be good enough. It just does. And just because somebody else got something you didn't want, like the fact that... Your neighbor owns a great car is no excuse for you to go buy a new car when you're perfectly happy with your truck. And that's kind of one of the models you have to do, where you have to have your own mental point of origin. And I know everybody loves that phrase when you're talking about things like uh, not putting up with BS and that, but how about in this situation? Like understand, mental point of origin is more than just not putting up with um, bullshit from the whammon. Next thing from it is, so he's reading stuff and it's about male and female nature. And I would argue he's most likely coming to the conclusion that uh, men and women are different. And the problem with men and women are being different is that women tend to have things in abundance that men have in scarcity and vice versa. So in other words, all the sex you could ever want, all the tension you could ever want, all these things that guys have to work for and earn are just given to women. And it builds a lot of resentment for guys because they don't understand men and women are different. But at the same time, those same women who could pick up a guy in five minutes or not even care and for them a dry spell is two weeks, they're the ones also saying, where have all the good men gone? So like, it's this weird monkey's paw curse where girls are able to give and get sex so easily, but really want a good relationship with strong tingles. Men, on the other hand, are easily able to commit and become breadwinners, but the getting the sex part is difficult. So from either side, everybody's seeing what the other person has and being like, why can't I have that? And then they're looking at the same thing. Why can't I have that? And then, so when you hear things like, for example, Rational Male talking about polarity between the sexes and how we're better off together, that's essentially the deal. You're trading your abundance for your scarcity and they're doing the same. And that's ideally where you want to be. But the trick is to do it in a way that you don't degrade your values or uh, cr let your boundaries be crossed. So in the next part of this, and Jack Ten of Hearts comes in, it's kind of a nice little like pep talk. Because I mean, most of the guys who have been red-pilled for a while, they've had their anger phase, they got through their anger phase. There's almost a residual anger phase that takes a little while to get rid of as well. And then after that, you come out of it and you're pretty much you know, as close as you can be to self actualize as insofar as like a bunch of internet morons can get you there. And Jack puts it best. Focus on yourself and your problems. Yeah, some women are cunts. Some men are also whiny entitled beta males who act controlling and mate guard. So consider that your mental models are much more likely to be developed by your own formative experiences. And sociology, psychology is probably a better basis than evolution. Uh, unless you actively make decisions considering your reproductive future, it's unlikely your wife is either. She's probably just being a bitch because she would rather watch her mom bitch out her dad all the time. It's another thing too. Remember, kids kind of learn from their parents, watching their behaviors, not listening to their lessons. So for a guy watching your dad get emasculated by your mom or your mom kicking him out and take the role really makes it hard for a guy developed like an idea of what would make an ideal man. What kind of archetype can he use? What kind of mental model towards masculinity? And I know a lot of brands talk about rites of passage and I think they're kind of missing it. 
They're acting like there's some kind of final exam to be a man, and it's not it. It's just when people learn a skill. Art is a great example. When you first learn to draw, the first thing you do is mimic. You do mimic, and then you adapt, and then you create. And it's the same thing for those formative years, mimicking what you see as masculine behavior from father figures, from uh, male role models, that all works. But for a lot of guys, that's just gone. It's just not there. And the few times it is there, they're given such horrible parenting strategies that it ends up giving them a skewed vision. Girls no different. Like I said, it's, what's that uh, Chris Rock line about hugging your daughter right out of those stripper shoes when she turns 20? It's the same thing. So if you get a girl who's ever only ever seen mom bitching out dad all the time, that's what she's going to default to, especially when emotions run high, because in a crisis, we always default to our training. We don't rise to our expectations. And this is something too Op has to realize, like, I don't want to say it's your fault. And I kind of don't want to say it's your responsibility either. But if there's an outcome you want, you have to make steps towards that. And in this case, his mental models and his outlook on this and his acceptance that, you know, women can just be bitches just has to be part of it. And you can argue the juice is not worth the squeeze, but if you're not going to divorce her over it and leave your family over it, then basically you've decided that's not an option either. So you can either sulk or get over it because sitting on the fence on both sides of it is just going to hurt your ass. Uh, Jack continues, though, our legal system has essentially ended what I call the breadwinner's entitlement. Paychecks in this day and age count for zero in your marriage. Now, that's also true for women who earn more than men, but the median noob, novice, married or red pill marriage is a guy with a long commute time and a taxing job with tiring hours who is too exhausted to continue and contribute to what otherwise is his household duties. Should his wife appreciate his sacrifice and bring home the bacon? No. He's not entitled to that sac. He's not entitled to that appreciation. Nobody is. If you can't add value to somebody besides your paycheck, you may want to look inward before you start whining about divorce rape. You know, I gotta pause there. I gotta pause there. I think that's a... I have been saying this for years. And for years, guys refuse to acknowledge that statement. Women are earning money now. Women can earn money now. Women who decide not to earn money now, divorce is like a serious payout option for them. So you hear a lot of guys bitching about divorce rape. So then my question to you is, well, why do you keep leading with your paycheck then? The issue is people aren't mentally equipped for the new sexual marketplace. That's like somebody who's like, I'm scared of neck punches, and he walks neck first into every situation he finds himself in. It makes no sense. So again, start looking inward. What are you doing that's contributing to the problem? What aren't you doing that would alleviate you from the problem? Either managing the risks, mitigating the risk. Now in this case, I've made the case that you want to be positioned as a luxury good as opposed to a commodity. Because you coming home with a paycheck is a commodity. One paycheck is just as good as another. Money is money is money. As a luxury good though, and I know this is weird to use branding terminology to talk about true love, but that's essentially what it is. Like somebody will pay a hundred times what something is worth just for what it says about them. Just remember that next time you see a girl with a $10 Walmart purse and another girl with like a $3,000 Louis Vuitton bag. Functionally identical. The difference is though, the woman is willing to pay so much more for what that purse says about her as a person. Now consider instead of a purse, that's a man. I call this purse masculinity and I kind of laugh at it. So you're, if you look around, you're gonna see signs of an increasingly feminized society or maybe not since fads like metrosexual seem to be dead and TV shows portraying wives making their husband jump through hoops for sex like everybody loves Raymond are no longer on the air. Our society is broad and diverse enough find evidence of whatever macro society point of view you want to hold. Consider any political argument. You can point to the pointless example of, for example, police are to blame with poor relations for black communities or the exact opposite. And the truth, as with pretty much everything, lies somewhere in the middle. A good point on that one, by the way, is, and I know this sounds woo wooish, but like you do make your own reality. If you're not treated well here, go somewhere else. If you find that uh, as a minority, you're treated horribly in the hood, then getting out of the hood is probably one of the best ways to get treated better. 
The reality hasn't changed. What's changed is your perception and your reaction to it. Which is kind of funny when you think about it. It's like almost the secret had a point, but not really. So Jack continues, you may be angry about past behavior from your wife. You'll feel like her feedback was intentionally misleading, and she was trying to suggest that you do things that are the exact opposite of canonical red pill wisdom. Your wife is unlikely a drone of the feminine imperative hive mind, but probably just an anxious person, unable to overtly communicate the broad issues and potential solutions. Now, it would be nice if wives could communicate clearly and directly with the exact prescriptive advice we could do to be more attractive partners, but that's not how it works because that's not how humans work. Consider the last time you asked somebody to apologize and they said, okay, sure, whatever, sorry. You probably felt like it was pretty hollow because their apology is not authentic. And this, among other reasons, is why your wife seems to expect you to be a mind reader. She wants authentic behavior from you. I should almost say sincere. I know a lot of people like using authentic, but authentic isn't the right word here and I kind of take qualms with Jack using it. Like, authenticity is Tom Cruise playing a very convincing super spy in Mission Impossible. That's an authentic performance. Sincerity is are doing things that you either believe or without uh, the other person manipulating you overtly. It's like, I want to treat you better. It's not that you nagged at me and so I treat you better. So she wants authentic behavior for you. And this is simply conforming to the last thing she's nagging about is a lose-lose scenario. You're not happy and she's not happy because you just did the last thing she act. Authentic behavior is incredibly attractive even if your behavior isn't one that you personally prefer. And if you doubt this, consider a significant number of Donald Trump's followers saying, I don't agree with everything he says, but he's honest and he speaks his mind. and That's what I want in a politician. So I'm writing all this, not to stop making you angry, but to present some broader viewpoints on where to consider the sources of your anger. Your mental models worked very differently than what Red Pill presents, but you're here, and you've been alive long enough to know that you can hardly consider it anybody's fault. So you don't have to mentally beat up and blame yourself for being a plugged in blue pill idiot for most of your life, but you should probably ask yourself, if you're going to get anything out of mentally beating yourself up or for blaming anybody else. So I'm going to end on a couple thoughts. And I think, uh, why more please? If you guys don't know, he's been a very prolific poster. He's been around longer than me, probably the strongest frame within the red pill space, hands down, but he put it best. Okay. Well, what are you going to do about it? And this is, this is the, the whole point of why anger needs to be a phase. Yes. Grievances happen, and anger is the only social emotion that exists. It's also the primary male emotion. It's like I always say, if you if you stub your toe, you're hurt, but you're not angry. But if somebody steps on your toe and they did it on purpose, you're angry because you have that combination of pain and social grievance. So when there's an anger phase, there is a measure of social grievance. That's why it's so easy to blame women for all your problems, because that's a person. And it's not that women are just doing their bobbleheaded things. It's like, no, she specifically wanted to beat you up. And that's why guys latch on to stuff and misinterpret like Rolo's talks about the feminine imperative and hypergamy. And they're like, yeah, it's hypergamy's fault. It's the feminine imperative. It's that evil war room of, uh, of masculine short haired women. It's those feminists, damn it. They're the reason my wife slept with Chad. And it's like, if you need to create an archetype for your anger, fine, do that. Just realize though, there's a purpose to it. You get it there, you get angry, you realize you're just yelling into the hurricane and there's nothing you can do about it. So you become at peace. You're like, okay, so that's the way it is. I now know the roadmap. I now know the rules. What do I do about it? The breadwinner example he used before, like I said, luxury branding, that works. Have a working spouse. Everybody's talking about they're so worried about working their entire life to make their million dollar empire only to lose 60% of it in divorce plus 300,000 more in lawyer fees. Well, did you ever think if you're going to work your whole life, build this million dollar empire just to lose it all and have be left with $300,000 sleeping in a bus? Why not just earn $300,000 and take all that time you would have spent building your fortune to focus on the relationships around you? That means 
get a working wife so she has something some gainful employment things to do it also hedges against like courts always look at that they're like okay did you decide that you were going to be taking care of this person financially did she decide from a court perspective that she is going to sacrifice her future earning potential to stay at home and cater to your needs and when you go no she's got a job too she earns 40 percent of what i do the courts would be like all right fair enough the split becomes a little more amicable and if you doubt this is possible there has been a case of and I'll, i don't mention her much but her name went uh, darla 10. new york fashion designer type person probably one of the two red-pilled women i've ever met and i don't mean that in the sense that like she loves rollo's work and that i mean in the sense that she got divorced raped and that red pilled a girl pretty fast like nothing will red pill a girl better than being treated like a man for a length of time and in her case how did her story go her husband stopped working and decided to be a stay-at-home husband not even a stay-at-home dad naturally she got kind of bored of having dead weight around the house they ended up getting a separation she had to pay him alimony and they eventually had a kid, so he got the child support payments. Girl got red-pilled fast. But again, that's the situation, and it makes sense. If you decided to financially support somebody, or they unilaterally make that decision, and you don't say anything about it or do anything about it, then what's the court supposed to think? Like, what signal are you sending? And so when guys come in with the anger face saying, my wife did this, my wife did that, it's like, well, you were complicit in it. And then the guy realized, like, oh, I guess I was. So what do you do about it? Well, you got to change the way you think about things. And so instead of instead of wanting that white picket fence breadwinner model, you pick one that's more applicable. You pick one that hedges against these big concerns you have, and you make different choices in your life. Instead of being the guy that's going to work himself to the bone, light himself on fire to keep others warm, you to look after yourself first. And then the extra that you have in your life, you can gladly flow that out to people who give you more value in life than they take away. And if somebody doesn't add value to their life, then they're not part of your life, whatever that means. And you hold people to expectations and to standards, maybe not as high as the ones you hold to yourself. But that's the thing. These are all very hard to do, and there's no right answers. And every guy has to be accountable to his own decisions. And for most guys, they are terrified on that. So it's very easy then just to sit there and be angry and point at some chick and go, this is your fault, you stupid bitch. And that's not the way ahead. It's not the red-pilled way of doing it. And I'm not going to lie to you. If you start doing that route, you're going to get monetized by a bunch of people who know an angry man isn't using his frontal lobe and angry men use their limbic brain and their limbic brain is a marketing tool. So stay safe out there, guys. Do what you got to do. I will catch you on the next episode. Cheers. <laughs>